It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. Joining me today is Michael Bungay-Stanier, Senior Partner of Box of Crayons, a company that helps organizations do less good work and more great work. He is also the author of several books, including the best-selling Do More Great Work, and his latest book, The Coaching Habit. You know, there's a lot of talk about coaching that goes on in business. It seems like more and more, and lots of books have been written on the topic. But what if coaching was simultaneously more simple to implement and more valuable in its impact than you've been led to believe? Well, my guest today... Michael Bungay Stanier has trained thousands of managers to become more effective coaches and is going to share some of his strategies to help you become a better coach. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, You know, I love the way you framed it. I don't think anybody said it quite like that, which is how can coaching be simpler to achieve and more valuable than you've been led to believe? I'm like, oh, I have to steal that line. That's fantastic. (laughs) So thank you for that. I just trademarked it and got the URL (laughs) for it. So So close. (laughs) So close. (laughs) Right. Well, it is. And I think that's that, you know, it's one of the takeaways from your, your book, The Coaching Habit. But when you think about it, you sit back and think about it, it's, it's yeah, one of the, the things that you draw out is that for something, and it's, it attracts what attracts me in general to what I talk about in sales and the things I believe in is that, you know, focus on the simple things, the basics, and you'd be surprised those are the things that really have the biggest impact, more than some of the tricky sales strategies and sales tactics is mm-hmm. focus on being responsive, focus on being present for the customer, you know, focus on asking great questions. And you can have all the fancy methodologies you need, but if you do the basics, the simple things, then you're going to achieve a lot more impact. You know, I I love the way you frame it like that. And when we talk about this stuff with the people with whom we work, we actually, we we talk about we want them to be more coach-like rather than we want you to be a coach. Because there's a bunch of people who, when you say, I'm going to make you a coach, kind of twitch at that. They're like, you know what? (laughs) That's that's the last thing I want. I've met coaches, and I don't want to turn into one of them. Um, And it's got that kind of weight of being a, you know, potentially it's an HR thing or it's an OD thing or it's too Californian or it's too, we have to hug each other and wear pastel clothing or stuff like that. (laughs) I'm like, forget all of that. Look, being more coach-like is just another way of being uh, a leader, it's a tool in your leadership uh, uh, kit, which is pr- probably underutilized. Now, actually, because we're talking to folks who are a sales audience, the possibility, though, is actually it's less underutilized to use that double negative. Because here's the thing, there's such a strong correlation between what coaching is or being more coach-like, which is fundamentally staying curious for just a little bit longer And what great sales conversations are, which are, you know, I'm no expert in sales, but as far as I can tell, it boils down to this. Stop telling people what you've got to sell until you figure out what they actually need. (laughs) Well, yeah. Well, I I mean, one thing I I got from your book, and I was sitting there furiously scribbling notes when I was reading it, was, yeah, as we start going through, you have your seven primary questions that you talk about, and we'll we'll delve into some of those later on, Um, seven primary questions you should ask as a coach. And my notes to myself was, well, these are really great sales questions. Right. <laughs> and right. so, yeah, there's a, there's a real overlap, as you talked about, or correlation between the two. So before we jump into that, so take a minute, introduce yourself to the audience. You know, how did you sure. get into this business of, of coaching and being an expert in it? Yeah. So, um, you know, like all life plans, involves a fair amount of stumbling around rather than one kind of clear shot. <laughs> oh, really? Like, you, didn't, you didn't dream of doing this when you were four years old? I did not dream of doing this when I was four years old. So, I'm Australian by birth. and um, You hide it uh, well. <laughs> well, thank you very much, although I'm, I'm proud to be an Australian. No, I was talking about the accent. <laughs> yeah, the, the accent is uh, the accent's a bit of a, a, a mixed accent because I've lived in the, the States and England and Canada now, where I, in Toronto where I'm based. You know, and as a teenager, I was one of those guys who would sit in a car with my angst-filled friends talking about their love life, and I was pretty good at listening to people talk about stuff, although I sat there going, I have no idea what I'm doing here, and is there something else to do other than just 
nod my head and go, oh, I know, isn't it terrible? And when I went to university in Australia, I did a, a law degree and a, a, a bat, an arts degree in literature there. I actually joined the telephone crisis counseling hotline there and kind of suicide stuff there. And that was my first introduction to a more structured conversation where you stayed curious and you kind of probed into what was really going on. Um, I had the good luck to win a Rhodes Scholarship that took me from Australia to England. And I say good luck because, A, I met my wife while I was at, in Oxford, um, but also it stopped me becoming a lawyer, which is the real blessing because, <laughs> man, I would have been a, I'd have been a terrible lawyer, um, evidenced perhaps by the fact that I left law school in Australia being sued by one of my own law lecturers for defamation. <laughs> it's, like, it's another story, but it's like uh, – We'll take if, that one if offline. That, if that wasn't a clue that I shouldn't be a lawyer, <laughs> I don't know what was. Um, and when I, when I um, – finished uh, university in, in at Oxford. I worked for a while in the world of innovation and creativity, inventing products and services, and then I moved into kind of management consulting and helping kind of large-scale change for organizations. And I started really seeing the difference between uh, the power of giving advice, which is really where most people default to, they love to give advice, to the power of asking questions. And um, the the how effective it can be to stay curious just a little bit longer. Now, by now, I'd left Boston where I'd been living and moved to Toronto. The job I had had vanished because I actually had a flight leaving Boston forever on 9-11. So that was kind of my own little miniature version of the, of the mess of 9-11. But shortly after that started Box of Crayons, my company. Mm-hmm. And shortly after that... Well, I don't know if you know this uh, metaphor. I, I'm stealing it from Jim Collins, uh, one of his other books, not the good to great one. And he says, look, strategy at its best goes like this. It's bullets and cannonballs. You fire bullets, first of all. Bullets are low risk, easy to do, low cost experiments to figure out where the real target is. But once you figure out where the target is, you fire the cannonball. And Jim Collins's metaphor, which I like, mm-hmm. is uh, most people either fire their cannonball too early. They're like, okay, I'm all in. I don't really know what's going on, but I'm all in. Or they fire it too late because they find the target, but then kind of never, never have the confidence to kind of commit to going all in. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and of course, I'm, this is in retrospect, so it, always, it seems a whole lot clearer and more courageous than it probably actually was. But when we figured out that giving – busy managers and leaders, really practical coaching skills so they could work less hard but have more impact. That's what we want to do. Right. That, that, that was my cannon. That was the moment, moment for my cannonball. That's where we kind of went all in on that. So let's, let's talk about the coaching habit here now. That, sure. So you have a statement in there that I thought was, I thought was interesting. And, and <laughs> <laughs> you say, everyone now knows that managers and leaders need to coach their people and the first thing that came to mind is, really? I mean, do they really know that? Uh, because I was just at a conference last week, and it was a sales conference, and it was admittedly a little skewed toward the tech business. But you know, there was really a statement being made on more than one occasion that here's a group of people that think that really data can replace coaching. Mm, interesting. Well, I guess it depends – we, in some ways, it, it, we we probably need to go back. And go well. Let's talk about what we're talking about. What do we mean by coaching? And, yeah. So, and what's the difference between managing and coaching? Yeah, that's a wow. That's actually. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had to answer that question before. So I'm going to have to sit there and wrestle with it. Let me let me tell you how I think about what coaching is because it can come with kind of sporting metaphors tied in. And often when people co- go think about coaching, they think of two things. I either think of the executive coach. So that's the the person who kind of shows up once a month or once every two weeks and spends an hour sitting down with some sort of lonely senior executive to help them figure stuff out. Or they think about the sporting analogy, which is like, you know, the 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 mentor, the expert who calls people in and goes, right, let me tell you what you're doing wrong and now let me tell you what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And for me, neither of those are quite the right the the right fit when I talk about coaching. What I'm talking about is as a busy manager, as a busy leader, how do you stay curious a little bit longer? How do you use questions to more effect so that you are allowing the person you're managing or leading or influencing 
to figure stuff out for themselves so that they feel uh, wiser, so that you've expanded their capacity and their potential because they've figured stuff out rather than you telling it to them. So they feel engaged and empowered, so they're more likely to go and do the thing that they've just figured out. How do you actually grow the capacity and the engagement and the, the impact of the people that you lead? And coaching is one of those tools that helps do that. And uh, what's fantastic is that neuroscience, the science of how the brain work, has only gone, has only proved that coaching is one of the most powerful and effective leadership techniques. Well, and it sounds like what, if I draw my own metaphors, yeah. is that coaching, as you're describing it, is really more like. Uh, Therapy, <laughs> psychological right. therapy, in that uh, you know a therapist doesn't provide the answers; they ask the questions to try to lead you to an answer. Right. So showing curiosity, whereas management is more about giving advice, more about giving direction. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think those are those are both uh, potentially true. I, I try and steer away from the therapy analogy because that scares the <laughs> the watchers out of all sorts of well, people. I, like, I don't yeah, want to come into your you office. You don't be a and, therapist, like, but I'm just saying, is yeah. is from a role perspective, is you're asking questions, right, and not providing answers, and that's you know, that's one role where you know if you and, go see a therapist and they're giving you a lot of answers, right. then probably need to see another therapist. You know where where <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Um, where you know, there's a great article by a guy called Daniel Goleman. Mm-hmm. It's it's from Harvard Business Review, and I right. think it's Wrote emotional about, intelligence, right? Yeah, you, so that's what Goldman is best known for. He kind of popularized emotional intelligence, but I think around about the year two thousand, he wrote a book called Leadership That Gets Results. And here's what he said that was interesting. He said, "Look, we didn't think of leadership as a thing you do, but actually there are six different styles of leadership, and they're all appropriate at certain times, and there's all they all have a price you pay for exerting that form of leadership." And he rattled through them. There's kind of the dictator. There's the um, the democrat. Uh, there's some others. Coaching was one of those six leadership styles. Mm-hmm. And what he said was, coaching, even though it has the greatest impact on engagement, it has the greatest impact on corporate culture. And you know, there's all this talk at the moment about culture beating strategy, eating strategy for breakfast. Right. Even though I think it was second or third on having the best impact on the bottom line results. It was the least utilized of the leadership skills. So for me, I, I'm, I, I would love people to not think about management as that's where I just tell you what to do. I'd love to think of management in that broader sense of going, how do I help myself, my team, and my organization achieve the best results where we have the most possible impact and we stay engaged as best as possible? And that's not always just telling them what to do. That's using a range of strategies to help you get there. And coaching is one of those strategies. Yeah, I mean, interesting in the in the sales world is yeah, you know, there's a oh gosh, a sort of a broadening chasm I think between managing and coaching. I mean, there's there's right. managers. I say I think it's it's partially due to the fact that you know we've got these great technological innovations and. Uh, tools that we can apply to the selling process and the that generate tons of of data, and so right. things do need, seem to be so metric driven that mm-hmm. you oftentimes see managers, you know, really sort of, like I said, wedded to the data and the metrics as thinking, "Oh, well, this is the way we're going to make things better," and the coaching, you know, really sort of falls by the wayside. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, I was talking to somebody just a couple of days ago. And she works internally for one of the big banks here in Canada, and she is um, a kind of a learning and development person for the core centers in one of the big banks. And the core centers are another part of our working world, which are hugely driven by data. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like mm-hmm. time on the phone, right. time all to get to the time, point, right. Right. all of that sort of stuff. And uh, so you'd think it was very much a culture of, look, I'm just going to crack the whip and tell people what to do because I want them to hustle. And what they found is that by uh, giving managers kind of practical coaching skills, kind of making coaching not a kind of big, weird, odd HR, scary thing, but just here's just a way of interacting with somebody. 
um, they found huge benefit in their business results. They decreased um, turnover by, I think, about 30%. They've had double-digit growth in both uh, top-line and bottom-line results um, in just a year or so since they uh, have introduced this coaching approach. So I just would say, obviously, there are times when telling people what to do and going to the data is is the thing to do. But it's it's a bit of a blunt tool, and it's probably overused rather than underused. Coaching, I'm going to suggest, an underused, underutilized way of actually getting more impact and more focus from the people that you're working with and leading. Right. I think that you talked about this earlier, that that – or at least alluded to it, is that there's this perception of coaching as being this big thing. And, you know, hey, we're going to meet every week and have our one-on-one meeting, and I'm going to coach you, you know, through whatever right. problem, challenge you're facing right now. And as you talk about it, and I think which is, is really the way people should be approaching it, is that it really is much more of a daily informal event totally. that takes place. Yeah, so... You know, it doesn't work if you say to people, look, good news, we're about to add a new responsibility to your already 60 hours a week working. You're going to coach people now. And they're like, oh, God, I'm not going to, that's never going to happen. So for us, we've got two things that are really paramount. The first is, if you can't coach somebody in 10 minutes or less, you don't have time to coach them. So part of the drive in the book is to make coaching simple and easy and kind of, well, I could do that as a sort of response. The second key insight is we're not looking to add to anybody's workload. We're looking to transform some of the current interactions. So it's not about going, you need to add a 40-minute one-on-one coaching session. It's like that interaction you already have with Paul or with Andy or whoever, that's that, try doing this instead of the other thing and see how that works for you. Right, right. Well, we're going to get into what some of those things are right after the right. break. We're going to take a short break here. Be right back with my guest, Michael Bungay-Stanier. Hi, this is Andy. Connect and Sell is used by sales reps at nearly 1,000 companies, including hundreds of technology startups and several Fortune 500 companies, to overcome the challenges of getting prospects on the phone. Companies using Connect and Sell grow their revenues faster by enabling their sales reps to have more sales conversations in 90 minutes than they could otherwise achieve in an entire week. Connect and Sell can be deployed directly to your sales reps, or you can take advantage of their outbound on-demand service, which delivers qualified prospect meetings scheduled directly on your sales reps' calendars. Visit connectandsell.com to learn more about how Connect and Sell can start filling your pipeline today. All right, welcome back. We're talking about coaching with my guest today, Michael Bungay-Stanier from Box of Crayons in Canada, author of the book, The Coaching Habit. And we just got through talking about how coaching needs to be a daily informal occurrence that, that transforms some of the current interactions you're having anyway with people that work for you or work with you that you're responsible for coaching. So I, I you had sort of interesting uh, breakdown sort of benefits of to the manager of coaching. And I, th- I thought it was really sort of, the first one in particular I thought was really interesting is I sort of reframe it as, as so you sort of reduce your codependency <laughs> with the right. people that, that – uh, that might be working for you. And why don't you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so here's the thing. You're trying to be really helpful. You're doing this with the best possible intentions, with a good heart. So when somebody comes to you, like, let me give you the answer. So now they come to you more often because you give them the answer. So then you give them the answer more often. Then they come to you more often. And before you know it, you're in this death spiral where somehow you have trained your team into incompetence and and a complete lack of self-sufficiency. So if anybody's listening to this and going, God, you know, I wish my team just had more independence, made some more decisions, felt more capable and competent. Well, the truth is you may be partially responsible for how your team shows up because you keep feeding them the answers, the solutions, the advice. Because honestly, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel smart. It makes like you're adding value. And of course, this is not to say never give anybody ever advice ever again. I'm just saying it's an overused skill at the moment. And if you gave less advice and just slowed down on that and asked a few more questions, you might be surprised to see, A, how much they already know, B, how much they can figure out for themselves, and C, how little your advice is actually needed. Yeah, which is a good, a good a great point, how, much, <laughs> how, how little is actually needed. So right. you have seven primary questions you surface in the book about that managers or coaches should be asking people that they're working with. 
And I just want to run through some of those in the time that we had. So the first one is you called the kickstart question. And mm-hmm. a very simple question to start a conversation. As we talked about earlier, for people who are listening to this, who you know have a sales background, are in sales, either a manager or, or a sales professional, is this is actually a great sales question to start a conversation with the prospect. So the first question, the kickstart question, what is it? Nice. I like the way you've built it up. Like we need a little drum roll, please. It's like so the opening question, the kickstart question, what's on your mind? What's on your mind? And here's why I like it. Um, and it's because on the, it's both open and focused. It is open in the sense that you are turning control of this conversation over to the other person. And you go, so let's let's start where you want to start. Let's be you centric. Let's be customer centric. Um, let's have that conversation. But it's not tell me everything that's going on or anything that's going on. It's like tell me the thing that's worrying you or exciting you or overwhelming you or consuming you at the moment. Tell me about that. Let's go somewhere important fast rather than that kind of slow, meander, chit-chat, maybe we'll get to the point eventually, conversations that can not exactly derail a a, a sales conversation or a a managerial conversation. just means that it never quite actually gets on the rails in the first place. So how do you get if you if you're believing that you can coach in ten minutes or less, which is key to the how we think about things, you've got to get to the real issue fast. And what's on your mind is one way to accelerate that conversation. Yeah, I love it. I mean, it's 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 to the point. You know, it's not that you don't, as you talk about, it's not that there's not uh, you know a personal element that might precede that a little bit of personal talk and so on. But but this is a great way to dive right into what is first and you know the top of mind. For the person right, you're talking exactly. with, yeah. And so, if, from a coaching perspective, if you think about this as you're trying to make this part of your daily routine, you want to set aside 40 minutes every day for one-on-ones. <laughs> is you know, if you're doing a little bit what Tom Peters used to talk about, management by walking around, right? Yeah, you know, when you encounter somebody, you can have this conversation. You know, what's on your mind? Yep. Uh, and you know, if and if you if you already have one to one-on-ones, which most managers and leaders do. And honestly, you're a little bored and they feel a burden rather than a <laughs> something useful and joyful and know that the person on the other side of the phone or table is feeling probably the same. You can start re-energizing, revigorating those conversations rather than going, so tell me what you did this week or last week or tell me, let's go through the, our usual agenda. Just say, look, we're going to do things a little differently. Tell me of all the stuff that's going on for you, what's on your mind right now? And I promise you, it's going to be a more interesting conversation right from the start. It's customer focused, or it's other focused. Let's say, if it's not a customer, yes. you're talking to a coach. It's other focused, and that's that's really the key, right? If you're trying to have an impact exactly. on people and provide value, is they have to feel that you're focused on them. Brilliant. Yeah. Well said. Okay. So the next question, I like, is one you call the awe question. The AWE. Mm. It's an acronym, <laughs> and <laughs> I've uh, I've. I use it myself, but I, I have different words to it. But uh, why don't you explain what the awe sure. question is? So we make a bold claim with this one. We claim that this is the best coaching question in the world. Oh, because it's as soon one as of the you best questions that, in the world, period. <laughs> right. So as soon as you say that, people lean in and they're like, okay, this is going to be good. It's the awe question. It's the best question in the world. What's going on here? And the question is simply this, and what else? And what else? It, that's the acronym, A-W-E, and what else? So it's literally an awesome question. But, you know, when, as soon as I, I, I say that, Andy, there's this almost a sort of palpable sense of anticlimax. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> how's, that, how's that the best question in the world? I was kind of wanting a bit more, I don't know, David Copperfield extravaganza to show up here. But you, you, got, you give me nothing and then what else? But, well, but it's, it's, it's the best second question. That's how I frame it. You nice. know, it's the best second question in the world because yeah. you're always going to lead off with what's on your mind or if you're yeah. – you know, doing a discovery call with a, a prospect and you've got a question that, you know, stimulates them to start talking about what's top of mind for them. Well, what you're saying is, and what else is, the way I phrase it is, is and I got this from another, I didn't come up with this one, but uh, is, you know, tell me more. Right. Right. And what else? The same as saying, well, well tell me more about that. Exactly. Because you're asking them to, there's always another layer. And there's always another layer. Uncovering and- the possibilities of what else is out there. And I can tell you that their first answer is almost never their only answer, and it's rarely their best answer. So not only can you use it for the kickstart question, like, so what's on your mind? Okay, what else is on your mind? Okay, what else is on your mind? 
but also when you get into kind of getting to the heart of what the issue is. And, you know, the third question, the focus question in the book is what's the real challenge here for you? And that's really powerful because it really starts getting people to talk about the essential thing that if you're a salesperson, you're going to be trying to figure out a solution to. But again, don't be fooled by thinking that the first challenge is the only challenge or even the real challenge. It's just the first challenge. But here's the other reason why and what else is so powerful. The first step, you know, there's always more to find out. Mm -hmm. But the second piece is it is a powerful self-management tool. Because whether you're a manager and you're in a managing conversation or in a selling conversation, every fiber of your body is wanting to, to is twitching, wanting to leap in and offer the solution, Give offer advice. the advice, go to the answer. And you're trying to find a way of slowing down that rush to give advice, to offer the solution. And so asking and what else, if you're asking the question, you're not providing the answer. So it's really powerful as a self-management tool as well. And it's a critical point that you had brought up earlier. And I think, again, for people in the audience who are managers listening to this, is that the job of the coach is not to provide the answers. Right. And it takes a little patience because, as you said, every fiber of their being is twitching wanting to provide the answer, right. in part because you want to be done with this. Right. Exactly. And that's why we also emphasize the 10 minutes or less piece because there's that anxiety about it. Because if I start doing this coaching thing, I'm going to have no life whatsoever. I'm going to spend my whole life coaching people. I'm like, no, no. You're just trying to be a bit more coach-like in your current interactions. And actually, it may even speed things up a little bit for you. Well, and that's really the critical perspective is you're trying to be more coach-like. You know, as I like to say, is if you're a manager, a sales manager, and you're not coaching, what are you doing? Right, Exactly. Because you know, your whole job is to make your people, you know, help Flourish. transform their lives, make them better performers, make them better better people, whatever. Right. Is you're not going to accomplish that if you're just managing to a metric. That's exactly right. So you know, but remember, you you also are managing to a metric. So it's also about performance. It's not just making feel better. And also, there is a place for giving people advice. It's just not as often or as fast as you think. So just slow down the rush to giving advice. And so then your third question, and so the last one we'll touch on here, is you said the focus question. Yeah, and I, I, I love this question. And I'm sorry for my phone ringing in the background. That's, that's a bit of an annoying background. But um, the focus question is, what's the real challenge here for you? And I love this question. It is so powerful because so often people are working really hard Selling solutions, providing answers to the first challenge rather than the real challenge. And it's important to hear the way it's constructed. You know, it's not what's the challenge, because that's going to give you a certain answer. And it's not even what's the real challenge, that's going to get you a better answer. But what's the real challenge here for you means that you truly swing the spotlight away from the thing to the actual person who's actually dealing with the thing. And that's where things get really powerful really fast. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, so last last little bit I wanted to talk about, which I thought was really interesting, is, and this applies uh, to not only to coaches but to, to salespeople as well, is you talk about stop offering advice with a question mark attached. <laughs> yeah. So stop, <laughs> stop cloaking your advice in the form of a question. So tell people what you mean by that. Yeah, I love that you picked that up. So it's the fake question syndrome. It's like, okay, I can't tell them what to do. So I'll, I'll, I'll make it sound like a question. Have you thought of dot, dot, dot? <laughs> and right. that's, that have, is have not you, a question. Have you, have you tried? Dot, yeah, dot, have dot. you tried? Have you considered? Did you think about? You know, all of those are variations of, here's my advice. Kind of sounds like a question, but it isn't a question at all. It is just that that advice giving again. So it's like, look, if you're going to give somebody advice, give them advice. Okay? If you're going to ask them a question, understand what a good question is. And you pulled out two or three of the really good ones from the book there. I love that. Yeah, and I think this this whole thing about you know, not cloaking your advice as a question is something – Think about it in the sense if you're a sales rep and or a manager and you're looking at your sales rep's performance and you think about their discovery calls, how much of how many of their questions in their discovery right. are, are really leading questions. Yeah. You know, Mr. Prospect, have you tried doing X da 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 da? You right. designed to focus them on what you do as a, and it demonstrates a lack of curiosity. And the person you're and, speaking and with understands that that there's a lack of curiosity there. And you know what it's on when you're on the other side of it. 
you know when you're being worked through a sales script where you're being given these kind of yes no choices around right. things and you you create resistance to that because um you know just on a neurological level a brain science level there's that way of i've the, the prospect is feeling manipulated is feeling out of control is seeing what's happening to them and you know maybe this is just me projecting because when it's done to me i'm like oh i see what you're doing mm. and you 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 are killing the sales call right now because of the way you're you know you're manipulating me you know in a kind of 1980s style sales conversation yeah i mean the questions you should ask as a coach or and think about it. i mean a sales a sales rep is really a coach to the prospect right i mean your right. your job is you're providing a service to help them be able to make a decision about what to do yeah and you know if it's purely leading questions as you said, they're going to feel manipulated as opposed to thinking that you're really curious and interested in what their problems are and how you might be part of the solution for it. Right, exactly right. All right, well, good. Well, I appreciate that. We're going to jump into the last segment of the show. I've got some standard questions. Asked Excellent. All my I'm, I'm, I'm on edge to find out what the questions are. Lead on. <laughs> all right, well, you're the star of the first one. So the first one's a hypothetical scenario. Okay. And you've just been hired as the new sales leader at a company whose sales have stalled out. And mm-hmm. they want to get unstuck in a hurry. And the CEO is really looking at you, Michael, to make a difference quickly. So what two things could you do your first week on the job that could have the biggest impact? Well, my starting point is to think it's always easier to sell to current customers than to new customers. Mm-hmm. So the first thing I'd be going is thinking to myself, okay, who are our current customers and where are there opportunities that are potentially um, unused, un- underutilized with the current customers? So I think that would be the the starting piece. The the second piece would be actually going, sitting with the sales team and saying, this isn't my problem to solve, this is our problem to solve. So, and this is going to pick up on some of the questions from the book, what's the real challenge here? Okay, and what else is the challenge? And mm-hmm. what else is the challenge? So rather than rushing into the, oh, okay, I think I'm just going to fix this and here's my advice or here's my solution, I would stay curious as long as I can to figure out what's really going on here. And I would share responsibility with my sales team and say, how are we going to turn this around? Excellent. I like that. And, I, and I, for people who have been listening to the interview, you know, you've used the phrase several times about stay curious as long as you can. Well, I think is a great phrase. And it's uh, to me, I interpret that as, and uh, in my own way of saying is, Always be prepared to ask one more question. Right, exactly. Okay, good. So additional questions. These are sort of rapid-fire questions. You can give me one-word answers or you can elaborate if you wish. But when you, Michael, are out selling your company services, what's your most powerful sales attribute? Um, <laughs> so I, I have the luxury of this being my own company. And um, one of the things that we've got clear about as our own company is that we're not going for um, <laughs> global wealth. So I'm more interested in the impact this, our programs have with our clients than necessarily trying to squeeze the last dollar out of the, out of the sale. So I think, and uh, maybe just this may be wishful thinking, but I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I think that sense of I'm not about the hard sell, I'm more about the longer term relationship and the longer term impact, mm-hmm. I think allows us to, when we do find our clients, find the clients that we really want to work with. Got it. Okay. So who's your business role model? Hmm. Uh, well, I tell you, I mean, that's a great, another great question. There's, there's a few of them floating around, but um, one of the, the people I look to is a guy called David Allen. And some mm-hmm. folks will know David Allen. He's the, the getting things done guy. Yeah, so, love that book. Exactly. I'm really one of the kind of big names in productivity and efficiency. And I look to him because he's got a, um, a business which is in part built around himself as a thought leader and part built around intellectual property, so he's managed to untangle himself from his own intellectual property. The other thing I love about him is that he's created one book, which is a classic, and yes. that's it. He's, he's actually written a few others, but it's just one book that sold one bazillion <laughs> yeah, no, copies. Try, try to name the others, right? Yeah, exactly. And um, I would love that as well. You know, I just, What I hope for the coaching habit book is that it becomes a classic. 
Um, and having that as a role model is very powerful for me. I went, right, this is it. It's not so many business books come and go within the first three weeks or six right. months of their right. existence. I want this book to be around in five years' time and people talking about it. Excellent. Well, I love it. Um, and David Allen's book for people who are listening, <laughs> Getting Things Done, it's actually a great sales book as well. Um, right. I, I refer to it in my latest book, Amp Up Your Sales. <laughs> I draw from it in several parts because I think it's a great sales book too. Love um, it. What Besides your own, what's one book every manager or coach should read? Oh, and and every, and salesperson as well. Um, and let me, uh, I think it's by a guy called Ed Schein, S-C-H-E-I-N. Uh, he's an ex-MIT professor, and his book is called Helping. And what I love about this helping piece is the key insight to it, which is as soon as you start thrusting help onto somebody, you you kind of, he says you one-up yourself or you down, you down one level down them. Mm-hmm. Because you're like, I've got the advice, I've got the solution, I'm helping you, aren't you lucky? And in the kind of pushing advice onto somebody, you create resistance to the very advice you're attempting to provide. Love it. So his his solution to that, and you can see it kind of infused through the Coaching Habit book, is the power of humble inquiry. Um, so I think there's some really wonderful pieces in, in Ed Shine's book about how to stay curious, how to best serve the people you're trying to help. Love it, love it. That, that's uh, have not heard of it, and it's going on my reading list. So fantastic, excellent. All right, so tough question here, and we'll be at the last question is: What music's on your playlist right now? Huh. Well, you know, we've just invent, invested in Apple Music, so it's kind of an eclectic playlist at the moment, which I'm which I'm loving. But when it comes down to it, I am a Bob Dylan fan, uh, and I'm it. just I love Bob Dylan stuff, yeah. and some of it's terrible. I mean, his Christmas Carol album is one of the worst <laughs> albums ever about anything, and it's just terrible. But that man has an ability to coin a phrase, which I love. He's, a, he's and. I also love the fact that he is utterly uncompromising about his the, the way he shows up in the world. I, I saw a recent article about him playing for President Obama, and Obama was going, he's so cool. He just kind of was completely unflustered by the situation, kind of ignored me, just came on, played a song. At the end of the song, kind of shook my hand and then wandered off. Didn't get a selfie, didn't mm. pose, didn't have any of that kind of, oh, I'm with the president. He's like, I'm Bob Dylan. I'm here and I'm gone. Lucky you. I love that. Yeah. I'm bigger than you. Um, yeah. Yeah, in some respects, maybe. So, well, good. Well, Michael, I want to thank you for being on the show. My guest, Michael Bungay Stanier, excuse me. And how can people find out more about you? Thank you for asking. You know, uh, if they're interested in the book, uh, Amazon or a bookstore, obviously, but you can just go to thecoachinghabit.com, thecoachinghabit.com, and you'll find out about the book. If you want more about our business, our, we're at Box of Crayons, all one word, dot biz b-i-z or b-i-z excellent all right well good well thank you very much remember friends make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new to help you accelerate your success and the easy way to do that is to make this podcast accelerate a part of your daily routine whether on your commute in the gym or make it part of your morning sales meeting because then you'll be sure you don't miss any of my conversations with top business experts like my guest today michael bungay stanier who shared his expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks for joining us. Until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guests, visit my website at andypaul.com. 